The University of Port Harcourt is at the center of the Niger Delta, which means that uh, we are always open to opportunities for collaboration, opportunities for analysis of issues that affect the Niger Delta, affect communities in the region, especially as it has to do with the oil establishment. And let me now call on Professor Dennis to introduce the author of the book. So he has published, published a total of six books on, on Nigeria alone, and several other books on other African countries. So he's here to share, to give us the benefits of knowing what he's talking about in his last book on Nigeria, the Niger Delta region, the oil cause. So oil is being regarded as a cause, and he will tell us why he says so. Thank you very much. Um, I must say I feel quite privileged to come back to my university, in a way, since I was uh, trying to teach French in the late 1980s, and that's when I met my friend uh, Denis. So indeed, it was last century, uh, so we are not that young any longer, but anyway. Um, and thank you very much, Prof. Allen. Thank you very much to the Department of Political Science to organize this event. And thank you to the Uniport uh, for all this. Uh, I, I very much appreciate. So um, I'm, I'm going to tell you uh, a few words about a forthcoming book. It's not yet published, but I thought I own that to Uniport, you know, as a kind of avant-première before, uh, before the publication of the book. So the book should be published in French uh, next year. And I'm still working on the English translation. So hopefully it will be published in English in 2023 which uh, gives us more time, so maybe one day I'll come back to present the real book, you know, uh, uh, which will be uh, by this time uh, released. Um, I'll try to be, to be brief. Um, let me say a, a word first about it. It's a political analysis of the Niger Delta, and uh, the Niger Delta is the third largest delta in the world, and it's the biggest one in Africa, so it's quite a huge place. It's got a long history. It used to be a, a, a global center of the slave trade. Uh, and then, you know, after the uh, uh, Nigerian independence, there was also uh, one of the most deadly conflict ever in Africa with the Biafra War. Um, and um, now it's um, a, a region uh, which is ridden, still ridden with many conflicts. There are smugglers, uh, uh, traffickers, uh, armed gangs, cultists, and so, so forth. And you all know that, so I won't go too so much into details. So it's, it's, a, it's a region that has also a long history of violence, even before uh, oil production that started with Shell in uh, 1956. And um, today, oil uh, in the Niger Delta is viewed as a, as a curse uh, that actually uh, predetermined Nigeria to become a, con a kind of prime example of uh, financial misuse, uh, industrial waste, um, um, bad governance, endemic corruption, crime and endless violence. And uh, the people in the Niger Delta are paying a high price for this because of insecurity, because of oil spills, air pollution, uh, military repression, and various clashes between uh, different uh, rival uh, groups. Yet, and this is my take, I think we should go beyond the idea that oil is the main factor of the many problems of the Niger Delta. It's one of the factors, we should not dismiss it, but it's not the only one. And my take is that indeed bad governance is the real issue, uh, which is the heart of the matter of the Niger Delta uh, crisis. So in a way, I do challenge what we uh, political scientists call the uh, resource curse. Uh, economists also do so. Uh, thinking that oil is the main factor explaining corruption, violence, and so forth. Uh, so this is the take of this uh, book. And I think we should uh, avoid any form of determinism uh, here, um, because oil production represents just one of the contributing factors uh, to a series of problems 
uh, that uh, go uh, that uh, run far deeper into uh, into history. Before I try to summarize the book, which is in three parts, let me say a few words about the methodology. Um, I use qualitative and quantitative research. It's a combination of both, uh, and I'll say a quick word about it. What I mean by um, qualitative research is the field work I've done. You've seen some of my photos here. Um, so I did field work in Brass, uh, in Obolo, Eastern Obolo, uh, in Okrika. Uh, in Bawari and uh, Baramatu, I um, also uh, made pictures of one of the uh, oil bunkering, you know, the illegal uh, refinery. Um, so, uh, field work is extremely important. And I was privileged enough to do some uh, interviews with key st stakeholders of the, of the, of the Nardan Delta crisis, uh, including, um, historically, the uh, father of previous state, uh, late Chief Harold Dapabirie, uh, who was instrumental at independence to uh, actually uh, fight for the creation of uh, River State when uh, Nigeria had only three uh, independence, three regions at independence in uh, 1960. I also interviewed people like Asari Dukubo, uh, you might know him, or John Togo, who was one of the last uh, militant, as you call them. Uh, to refuse the amnesty in 2009, so I interviewed him before he was killed by the army in 2011. So I've done all these uh, interviews with um, militants, activists, ecologists, intellectuals, the elite, politicians, soldiers, policemen, um, well, um, and also fishermen, you know, uh, in Akasa, for instance, who live in a quiet, peaceful uh, environment. Uh, it's not all Niger Delta which is ridden by, by violence. We should be careful about that. So, um, qualitative research, uh, semi-structured interview, uh, interviews have been uh, extremely important in my work. And um, as Denis mentioned, I've been in and out of Nigeria for over 30 years now. So, it's, uh, this book is the result of 30 years of field work, you know, uh, coming back regularly to the Niger Delta to do some, uh, some research. Um, I also use uh, uh, quantitative data. Um, I set up um, a database in 2006, which is run now with the University of Ibadan. It's in Ibadan. It's called NarjayaWatch.org. You can uh, browse it on the internet, NarjayaWatch.org. And it's the body count of uh, the violence in Nigeria. You know, we, we record, we use uh, some uh, newspaper sources and we uh, record uh, little incidents. And as I will show, um, this was also useful to understand exactly the oil factor in the many conflicts that uh, affect uh, the uh, Niger Delta uh, today. So the book has uh, three parts. The book has three parts. Uh, the first part is historical, you know, so it starts with the Nigerian independence in 1960, uh, the story of the River State, uh, the first struggle for the independence of a Delta Republic under uh, Isaac Borrow, the late Isaac Borrow in 1966. Then the Biafra War, where I argue that oil was not the main factor for the Biafra War. Actually, um, the oil production went very low because of the war, so it did not fund the belligerents. Uh, only in late 1969, just a few months before the end of the war, the federal government could actually resume production. But at this time, the production was low. Uh, oil had been uh, discovered and started to be produced in 1958. So it didn't pay, play a very important role in the Biafra War. Uh, the pogroms of 1966 and the war for the, the struggle for survival of the Igbo uh, had a much more important role uh, in this uh, regard. Uh, then I investigate the oil boom of the 1970s and of course how the uh, military dictatorships put a hand and nationalized the oil industry uh, including in the 1980s and the 1990s, up to the uh, Mossop uh, revolution. I had the privilege to interview uh, Ken Saruiva because I knew him when I was actually uh, working in this university. So it was in 1991 or 92. No, it was even in 94. I went to follow up some of the Mossop uh, demonstration uh, in Ogoni land. Uh, so we could talk quite easily. I did not expect he would be hanged just, you know, uh, a year later. It was quite a surprise for me. Uh, so I investigate all the story of the Mossop and then, of course, 
the, how it turned into an armed struggle with the Ijo in the, in the 2000s with the uh, MEND and so many uh, larger Delta Avengers or armed groups up to the amnesty of 2009 and I finished of course with the PIA, the Petroleum Industry Act uh, that has been recently voted and which could have a tremendous effect on the oil uh, industry. So the, the first part of the book has very much to do with history. In the second part, um, I investigate the oil factor. What about oil? What, what, does oil? what is the role of oil in all these issues that you have in the, in the, in the Niger Delta? And I argue that um, the situation is quite complex and cannot be reduced to just an opposition between host communities and oil transnational companies, you know. So let me show you a graph to try to say a word about it, about the complexity. Let me uh, see if I can do that. Yes, fantastic. I hope those in the back can, can see it. To try to make things simple, uh, we have three main stakeholders. Basically, the oil industry. Oops, no, you don't see it. No, let me try. Yes, OK, here we are. That's better. So that's the key stakeholders and the relationship in the Nigerian Delta crisis. To try to make things simple, you have the state, you have the oil companies, and you have the communities. Some, sometimes people talk about the civil society, but for us political scientists, we're not very comfortable with this notion of uh, civil society. Let's talk about communities, but that's also something which is quite vague and hard to define. And actually what you, re you realize is that uh, it's more complex than just opposition between these three uh, main uh, stakeholders. Uh, as you know, the state is also divided. You have the federal government, the state governments, the uh, local governments, and you have uh, 123 uh, local governments in the so-called uh, South, South Geopolitical Zone. Uh, and their interests can also uh, be uh, different. Huh? So the state is not one block, it's also divided. There are also different political parties, different uh, clans, even within, uh, within the state. Um, and the relationship between the state and communities can be conflictual, but the state and communities also have common interests. Uh, so they have common interests when it comes to political stability, the fight against crime, uh, and also, uh, but they can, can also have some uh, conflicts when it comes to the, uh, uh, the sharing of the oil wealth. Uh, and of course also sometimes the conflicts with the security forces. Uh, the same with the relationship between oil companies and communities. You know, they have common interests when it comes to development, the reduction of violence, but they have also conflicts over land, over pollution, and also about the sharing of the oil wealth, for instance in the forms of uh, programs of uh, CSR, corporate uh, social responsibility, and, and so forth. The same with the state and oil companies. The classic Marxist view see it as an alliance, an alliance between the so-called comprador bourgeoisie, as we used to say in the 1970s, and the oil companies. But it's much more complex. Yes, they have common interests. Um, they want to make business, they want to make profit, they want to make money, no doubt about it. But they also have a lot of conflicts. And the PIA is a good example of that when it comes to taxation, and also about pollution, who is responsible for it, and then also about revenue sharing. So it's not always a peaceful relationship. It's also, there are also many conflicts between oil companies and the state. And also what is complex is that each stakeholder has deep divisions. It's not monolithic. You don't have one state lobby, kind of, and one lobby for the oil companies and one lobby for the communities. No, it doesn't work this way. So you have also conflicts within these stakeholders. Take the oil companies. You have indeed the most famous, uh, the international oil companies, Shell, Total, Mobil, Chevron, Ajip, and so forth. Uh, you have also some smaller private called independent oil companies uh, that are foreign. So this is the private sector. But you have also a lot of indigenous uh, Nigerian companies, um, Monipulo, Nest Oil, Oando, and so forth. And they are quite active on the market. 
you, then you have a public actor, which is the NNPC, which is to be privatized. We'll see how it goes. But as it is now, it is the uh, majority stakeholder in all the oil joint ventures of oil production since the 1970s. The NNPC and the state has at least 55%, sometimes 60% of all the assets of joint ventures in oil production. So the state is also within the oil companies because whether it is Shell, Chevron or Tatao, when they do operate, they have the minority shares because the majority is always the state through the NNPC. And the way the NNPC perform, the way they operate, the business model is quite different from the one of a transnational uh, corporation. And then you should not forget also all the contractors of the industry, you know, uh, the uh, small companies uh, uh, that have to do with uh, pipelines and so forth. So most often the public is focused only on international oil companies, but they're only one part of the business. And remember, all these companies are capitalistic. So their logic is to make profit, to make money. So you also have a lot of competition between these oil companies. They want to make money, they want to make profit. So don't think that it's just one block. They are also, that we also have conflicts between different oil companies. As for the communities, they are not one block also, you know? They can, uh, yes, thanks so much. <laughs> Uh, they can uh, also be divided by various language. Uh, you, have, you have also a kind of north-south divide that was very clear during the Biafra War with the Igbo in the Netherlands that were fighting for independence. And the minorities on the coast opted to uh, be pro goan this time and fight against the Biafrans uh, because they preferred to be governed uh, via Lagos and not through uh, Enugu in the former eastern region. So this north-south divide, which also refers to the history of the slave trade when the people in the Interland were sold to the European uh, by the people from the coast, um, this north-south divide is also still uh, valid today. Also, you have a kind of east-west divide in the Naja Delta, you know. Uh, the Ijo, the Calabari in Port Harcourt in the east, uh, do not have the same understanding of the political agenda as those living in whether in the core its own uh, uh, Ijo region in the Bayelsa or even toward uh, Wari. And it's interesting to see that some Ijo communities claim to be the pure Ijo, uh, whereas some uh, Ijo living in Port Harcourt are seen as kind of peripheral to the uh, core Ijo uh, land. Also, you have division between host communities and neighboring communities, because you know host communities be benefit directly from oil companies in the form of development programs, schools, electricity, running water, and so forth. But those who do not live near oil wells or uh, pipelines do not benefit from such programs. So it can create tensions also between host communities and neighboring villages that do not benefit directly from the presence of the oil companies. And then we should also pay attention to other, let us not be too culturalist, insisting on the ethnic divide. We should also think about the cleavage between age groups. And uh, in a way, Mossop was very much the revolt of the youth against the elders. You know, the uh, so-called traditional chiefs, the Warren chief, that were picked by the British and uh, that were cooperating with oil companies. So Mossop was also the revolt of the youth. So this age group cleavage do play a role. And you don't need to be a Marxist to think that, yes, there are also cleavage between social classes. There are cleavage between landlords uh, and their tenants. There are cleavage between the uh, natives and the settlers, um, as in many places in Nigeria. Uh, and all these conflicts do exist. And also during the crisis emerged new figures like warlords, kind of warlords, you know, Ateketom, Asari Dukubu, and so forth. And this go very much beyond ethnic divide, you know, it has to do also with the politicization, the use of armed groups by some politicians to win the elections, for instance. I'm sure I'm teaching nothing to you because you already know that, but let us remember that the communities are not one, it's not one block. 
So the book insists very much on this complexity. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so we should go beyond the linguistic difference in the communities huh? and, and, and think also about social classes and other forms of conflicts that can, uh, that can exist. So the part three on the book uh, actually um, claims, argues that poor governance, uh, the systematic uh, misappropriation of all revenue, uh, the uh, impunity enjoyed by criminals and the structural deficiencies of the state lie at the heart of the matter in the Niger Delta crisis. This is really the heart of the matter. And um, to many people, the state is a kind of Leviathan monster, as we say in political science, a kind of predatory power that preserves the impunity of the ruling class and uh, lets citizens fend for themselves to compensate for the lack of basic public services because of corruption, the diversion of money, then the public services are nowhere to be seen. You know, you know as much as I do that if you go beyond Port Harcourt in some rural local governments, the schools are, uh, some schools are empty, they don't have running water, they don't have electricity, sometimes the teachers are not even there, the same with basic uh, health uh, centers. Uh, so we know that corruption and impunity are two key words to understand the uh, crisis in the Niger Delta. And the third part of the book, uh, and I will leave room now for the, the question and answer, so let me finish on this one uh, as a kind of, of conclusion, but I insist also on the vast versatility of the elites in the Niger Delta. You know, sometimes there are some incoherence in the claims of the uh, militants, uh, some contradictions uh, of activists, and look at pollution. Uh, we know very much, I've shown some of the pictures I've made of the, uh, of, uh, the bunkering system. So, uh, let me uh, go back, all right. So, um, uh, some communities or some segments of the communities are also responsible for, for, uh, for pollution. We should not dismiss that. And, Remember that in the political economy of the oil industry, since the nationalization of the oil companies in 1970, the NNPC, that is the Nigerian state, has the majority share in every joint venture. All right? They have between 55% and 60%. What does it mean? When you look, so one source of pollution is bunkering. This is people's pollution, not oil companies. And People claim, okay, oil companies let it go, but of course, oil companies are not very happy to see that they invest money to produce oil, and this oil, this oil is stolen by some people, you know, by some criminal gangs. But this is one source of pollution. Another source has to do with the cracks in the pipelines that are not properly managed, or the glass fairing, and so on. Now, think about it. When you think about the maintenance, well, let's take NEPA or uh, PHCN, you know, uh, today there's no electricity, we need a generator. So, what happens when it comes to the maintenance of a pipeline? 60% should be paid by the NNPC and 40% by the foreign, by the international oil company, may it be Shell or Mobil or the other. And the international oil company, uh, they want to produce oil, so they do pay, but the 60% are not paid. You see? So there's a problem of maintenance because of the corruption within the NNPC, within the government, so the money is not there to maintain properly the oil pipelines. And this is clearly uh, an issue which is ongoing when, and which shows again how corruption is also at the core of the problem in the Nardo Delta. Uh, and corruption, of course, addressed directly the issue of governance, uh, much more than oil as a natural resources. So let me uh, finish maybe uh, by, by this, you know, by claiming that um, actually conflicts in the Niger Delta are very various. They are not only uh, related to, to oil and they highlight the importance of the local dynamics that are often overlooked, overlooked by theorists of the resource curse. And this is clearly what I'm trying to show uh, in this book. Oil is one of the contributing factors in the Niger Delta crisis, but it's not the only one. And to me, the heart of the matter is the state, the bad governance, corruption, impunity, 
the collusion between some of the uh, some people in the ruling class and some uh, some criminal gangs. And as long as it continues, I don't see the Nadaleta really improving and, and getting developed. So these are, to me, the core issues to be solved, and that's what I'm claiming in this uh, in this book, which hopefully should be released in English in 2023. I cross finger for that. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, thank you for the beautiful presentation. Um, right now we will start the most uh, important part important part of this presentation, that is the Q&A session. So if you have any question to ask, kindly indicate by uh, raising up your hand. Number one, two, three. So let's start with this first three. After that, we'll proceed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Presenter. Thank you, Professor, for giving us this opportunity. My name is Zoe Tamnotoy, a postgraduate student of the Department of Political Science. Uh, I want to really appreciate the in-depth analysis from a summary point of view that you have done. You have uh, feed my curiosity. I've also asked the question, is oil the main issue? I've been asking that question. And I think today, a renowned person who have made the research has answered that question. I agree with you, sir, that oil at this point is no longer the main issue. And the issues are those ones you have written in this uh, uh, presentation. That of corruption, bad governance, and most especially lack of, this has created lack of trust between the communities, the government, and even the companies. But where I have issue with your presentation is when you said the oil companies invested money, produce oil, and some criminal gangs come to steal. That's where I have problem with your presentation. How do we define these gangs that come to steal the oil as criminal gangs? Judging on natural justice, this is their land. For example, I'm a PhD student. Since 2019, I've been finding it difficult to even pay my fees while the oil well runs from my backyard. And in such frustration, if I decide to get and get some oil to sell and pay my school fees, you call me a criminal gang? That is where I have problem with your presentation. Where do we situate those you're calling criminal gangs in our society? So you can see the fireworks are started. Thank you. Uh, well, then it, it takes us to the definition of crime, you know, uh, infringing the law. And normally what should happen is that uh, oil companies are paying taxes to the government. And the government should compensate the people whenever an oil pipeline cross their land. This is no normal way anywhere in the world, you know. But the problem here is that people are not compensated because companies pay taxes, but these taxes are not uh, redis redistributed properly, you know. So that's where the issue of corruption come back again. Now, these gangs, uh, <laughs> yes, I would qualify them as criminal. Actually, I have, I have one chapter that I'm sure you're going to dislike whenever you, you read the book where I'm challenging a lot of Naja Delta academics who write about the struggle and they are sympathized with the struggle, so they don't have the critical analysis of the, of the struggle, and they consider them. There's one, even one academic, I forgot his name, who is uh, actually uh, praising Henri Oka, Henri Oka as being uh, his brother, and that's in the tradition of this academic book, so-called academic book. I mean, Henri Oka is a person who has been tried on jail in South Africa for being a terrorist and organizing the uh, terrorist bombing in, uh, on 1st October 2010 in Abuja, Eagle Square, you all know that. So, I mean, I don't know what's your definition of crime. To me, these gangs are criminal. You might think that uh, they go for social justice, they are kind of Robin Hood, you know. They steal because uh, the government is taking their land. You might, it, might think it this way, but abiding by the law, they are criminal, no, no doubt about it. Especially when they use violence. And that's where I would disagree with you. 
Because when you go to the communities, they also suffer from these armed gangs. And many times these armed gangs are not really from the community. They come and they press the people to let them go, and they dash them a few stipends, and then the community is suffering a lot. Which is also one of the issues of the PIA when it comes to the host community funds, you know, because they say that whenever there will be sabotage or bunkering, the community will, not longer, will no longer receive money for it. But are the communities responsible for these criminal gangs that are quite sophisticated in syndicates? And I've seen it with my own eyes. We know it. We know it. There's a collision with the security forces and, and, and the, 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 the defense forces. I mean, once I went, let me tell you an anecdote. When Asare de Kobo was in the bush, it was in 2004, you know, there was the crisis, the Niger Delta uh, People's Volunteer Force. So I went to interview him in the creeks. It was very difficult to organize, as you can imagine. So I didn't want to get kidnapped. I needed a <laughs> safe conduct, so I won't go into details. Anyway, so we went to some kind of jetty, and some of these Egbisu boys, they come with the, you know, the speedboat, the Kalashnikov, the red uh, uh, banner, and everything. So off we go. And then we cross a, a navy boat. And I was really scared, you know. I thought, oh my god, they are going to shoot each other. And they just wave hands. So I said, oh, I don't understand. I mean, aren't you fighting each other? And they told me, no, we do business together. And we all know that. I'm not teaching you anything. So when I'm saying criminal gangs, maybe the criminals are also within the government. I'm not denying that. But you have a problem with the way law is implemented with the rule of law. It's not only the Niger Delta, I would agree with that. But of course in the Niger Delta there is more money because of oil, you know. But no, I, I, stick, I'm, I disagree with you. I'll still call them criminal gangs. Number two. Uh, I, am, I am Jensen, Jensen Olo, a postgraduate student of, uh, of this department. I appreciate your meticulousness in this work, but I have a, an observation. The elements you regard as criminals, I don't totally see them as such. Because when someone takes something from you and continues taking something from you, you're being pushed to the wall. For instance, let me be practical. Our federal capital territory today is being developed with the money gotten from this region. And you go down to the creeks, the people don't have houses. They, they don't have anything. You take all these resources from the upper here, you go up north and develop Abuja and make Abuja unlivable for the poor masses. What do you expect? The least they can do is fight back. Even to get a job in NNDC here, NDDC, you have to get a letter from Abuja. Even in the board of directors, uh, the NNDDC board of directors uh, was about to be inaugurated. You have nothing as there. What are they doing there? So it makes it wrong to say that those guys who go about taking this thing by force just to get better, better their lives, are criminals. If we are talking about criminals, there are stages, of course. It's been talked about somewhere that we have what we call grand corruption and we have petty corruption. So if you're talking about corruption, it should be at there. And again, the imbalance, what a kind of a consequence of a new colonialism, you know, there's so much imbalance in the way things are done. Like you said, NNPC is the major shareholder in oil, this and that. I think that is more in theory. But in reality, there's something in there that is making us vulnerable. And the result is the agitations by the youth down here. So I think the address should be from the top. It will trickle down to the poor masses. Thank you. All right, let me answer this one. Uh, so you've got gangs or militants, if you want to call them. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, I just, just uh, to tell you that the dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences is here. 
I had mentioned that uh, he has been so busy this morning. So he's here, he's going to stay with us briefly. So I would like to give him the microphone. You know, he's supposed to give an opening remark and welcome all of us. So he's here now. We will continue as soon as uh, he does that. Uh, please, can we get a chair for, for the dean? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Allen. And uh, I declare you as our guest this morning to the Faculty of Sciences. Uh, dear President, I listened to you briefly before you wrapped up your presentation. Uh, good morning, our uh, students. Uh, good morning, other colleagues and... Uh, okay, let me stand out this way. Colleagues and uh, other guests here present for this uh, occasion. Like the head of the department said, I was supposed to be here earlier to give the opening uh, and welcome uh, remarks. But as literally today has been a very uh, busy day for us. Currently ongoing uh, is a board meeting of the Universal Portaco Business School, which I am a member. We also have special convocation ceremonies in honor of a departed in Okoli, Professor Ojule, ongoing. We have external examination ongoing at School of Brothers Studies. And uh, another meeting of the Committee of Deans and Provosts still concurrently running. I had to just make out a few minutes out, excuse myself, so that I can formally welcome you uh, to the Faculty of Social Sciences. I remember last week, Thursday or so, I got a call uh, when you came for a kind of a uh, organization you know, visit here, and I spoke uh, on phone with, uh, I think, one of you, I can't remember exactly. Yeah, okay, okay, we spoke on phone here, I want to give you a assured of our cooperation and support for this you know, program. So I want to ask that you feel good, you are home, I'm the landlord of this place. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you can be rest assured when your landlord say, please remain cool and enjoy yourself, that is no cause for alarm. So feel good. Uh, unfortunately, the lighting system is poor, we have a better generator now, but at least uh, we have one still in fan turning. Just make yourself good and comfortable. Investor of Water Corps is a very unique university in this country. And this faculty is also very unique in a faculty. We have produced men of timber and caliber within this country and even beyond. Late Professor Claudake, a very renowned political economist, was of this you know, faculty. Produced several other you know, scholars, the Kenna and Zimiro, Yeti Salao, you just, you know, can mention them, go on and on and again. We're very unique in our faculty, and uh, we have believed in the course of the Niger Delta. What we are seeing here, we quite appreciate, but we expect that the government should do more. The problems in the Niger Delta may continue, even in the near future, if proper attention is not given to the welfare of the goose that lay or lays the golden egg, which is the Niger Delta. I want to address people in uh, certain fora just as this. I let them know that it's out of deprivation that has made our put to carry arms. It's out of deprivation that has made us say, look, if we cannot get this through negotiation, let's get it by force. Because this is a commonwealth. We feel the impulse, or we feel the pulse, or we feel the impact of the oil and gas exploration that is feeding the whole country here. If an oil is filled, it's a gas flare, and our air is contaminated, our water is contaminated, we feel it more here than those in Abuja. So we deserve and desire to be treated fairly. And I'm sure it's because of this lack of uh, equity and social justice in the distribution of the commonwealth, unquote, that has led to what is happening in Nigeria. So whatever project that we sensitize the government of the day to appreciate that there is need for us to protect the environment and conserve the resources of this region, because the question I ask, when oil gets exhausted, what becomes the fate of the Nigeria? It's a big question we need to ask ourselves. The government also needs to ask themselves. However, given that, 
We are not preaching violence. All we are saying that we should be given fair treatment, that we desire and deserve better treatment than we are presently being given in this committee of uh, 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 what I call it, state or nation, we are actually a nation, whatever you call it. So once more, feel good, feel at home. We believe that at the end of this discourse today, you students will go home with something, and you will also learn something from us here, the local that you are interacting with. So I say, relax and have a lovely day. God bless you all. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much, Prof, for your uh, very uh, your welcome. Um, so, shall I continue an answer, or yeah? All right. Okay. So you were claiming that those that you call uh, militant, or I call them criminal gangs, um, actually have a right to uh, bunker pipelines because it is their land and so forth. And the government is not providing houses and the people uh, live in uh, sheer poverty. Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, these gangs, or these militants, sorry, uh, do they provide houses for the communities? They make money out of it, right? They do sell bunkered oil, they make profit, and I'm asking you, do they provide social services? Do they, do they provide doctors for health centers? Do they provide schools? School? No. So, is it greed that motivates them? Or is it political grievance? Let me take this. I've lived in Kenya. I've followed up some guerrillas that were actually really committed to defend the interests of their people. And the little money they had, they would try to build schools, to build health centers, you know, they would care for the people. I've not seen that. But maybe I'm wrong. I'm ready to discuss about it. Second thing, you said corruption is mainly in Abuja, so you should work on the issue of corruption at the highest level. It's the top thing. I think you should work at the uh, grassroots level also. Actually, in a way, Ken Sariva said it also. You, you know when he complained about the corruption of the customary chiefs, the so-called vultures, as he would call them? They would take the money from oil companies and do not give to the people in the community instead of paying for a new school or, you know, health centers. Then the money was nowhere to be seen. Corruption is at all levels. So it's also an issue you should address with your ruling class here, the state government, the local government chairman. We all know that there's, there's, there's a big governance issue here. And I think it's a bit too easy to blame scapegoat, you know? OK, the oil industry is to blame for everything. No, there are also problems which has to do with governance, with the state, and including at the very local level, not only the higher uh, level. The third person, was it the third, the fourth? OK, yes. Uh, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, sir, for your great presentation. My name is Paul Emanuel, a student of this great department, a finance student, BSc in view. My question this morning is, from what you've said so far, the Nigerian society, I'm, when I mean the Nigerian society in general, they want a stiffer punishment for these people, like the multinationals. Because if we, if we are saying the multinationals and the Nigerian elite, they are part of the problem we are facing. The Nigerian population, they want a stiffer punishment from these international organizations, the UN and these big uh, countries of the West. Like the newspaper pages, the stories we, we read every day, they, they are not enough. I can say the one of you communities have sued some of these oil companies, like the Ogoni Axis, and they have won their cases in court. It's a clear the, the, uh, uh, implication that the Nigerian society, we don't believe even in our own judicial system. Because if we take these uh, same companies to these places, we won't get the, uh, the required justice we want. But beyond that, we want these persons that are placed in charge of uh, one or two of these companies. We want a, a stiffer punishment for them. Not like they are benefiting from this system, yes. Responsibilities have been handed over to them, yes. 
did they deliver on their part of the responsibility as touching the general population? Because they don't. And in Nigerian society, they, we are helpless. There is nothing we can do to them. Because the capitalist system in Nigeria is so strong that it's a, it's a, it's a cabal, which is very difficult for an ordinary person to break into. But we are saying, with the influence of persons like you and the international community, we want a stiffer punishment for them. And I'm, my question this morning is, what has been your steps, considering the numerous pro problems we are facing, which is the cause of the several agitations you're getting from different sections of the Nigerian uh, society? Thank you, sir. Thank you uh, very much for your, uh, your, your question and, and suggestion. Um, stiffer punishment on international companies, why not? But that's not enough. Because if there is no punishment on uh, state governors, corrupt state governors, uh, or uh, presidents, you know, uh, it's to no avail. It's not enough. And actually, what's going on, think about, for instance, the famous Ali Burton case. I'm sure some of you know. And so they were tried, they were punished, uh, they had to pay a huge fines in, in, in the US. But they were corrupting some Nigerian powers that be, and nobody was punished in Nigeria. So, you know, corruption, you need, there's someone who corrupts and someone who is corrupted. So if you want to go into stiffer punishment, you, th you should think also about the way to punish people within Nigeria, Nigerian rulers, Nigerian people who are in charge, you know, and are not doing properly the job. That's what my book claims. Good enough for the international oil companies, but that's not enough. And what is going on actually is that they are divesting. There have been so many trials, they are all divesting, there are more prospects elsewhere. And oil is not the good business for the future after 2050, you know. There will be more investing in gas and renewable energy. So the foreign direct investment for the last five, six years has been going down, down, down in Nigeria. Shell is divesting uh, and some other companies are also divesting. So I think the future when it comes to the oil industry will change tremendously in the Nigeria Delta. So what we are talking about, we are talking about the past in a way, you know, but the future will be different, that's for sure. Okay. Um, after the after the HOD, we'll take, let's take uh, four, four, four sets of people. One, okay, one, two. Let's have ladies now, are they? Three, four, and after the four, we'll go. Um, I have two questions. Uh, Anthony. thanks for the clarity of your presentation. But I have two questions for you. One, by way of preamble, the question of power when it comes to relations among the international oil companies, the state and communities. You are a political scientist, so you understand the concept of power. How would you explain the processes and the outcomes that we all know regarding oil production? How would you explain the position of power in relation to the international oil companies even with France as a major actor shielding international oil companies that are registered in France operating in the developing world? How would you describe the power of the French government, the power of international oil companies emanating from France, and how that has affected the developing world, especially in Nigeria. Two, you talked about the PIA. And when you look at that document, you will see that it has five chapters. If you look at chapter one, you find that it has to do with the legal framework, governance, and all that. Each of the chapters in that act 
relates with the others in specific ways, whether we like it or not. Now, when you look at chapter 3, it has to do with host communities. And now there are fears. Some of the host community people are afraid that the international oil companies are going to give up on their modest social responsibilities towards these communities. Do you think it is correct for these international oil companies to withdraw from their modest corporate social responsibilities because of the contents of, the, of chapter 3, which has to do with those communities? Will it be morally correct? Okay, thank you for these two uh, very interesting uh, questions. Uh, actually, in my book, I argue that uh, the, yes, we know international oil companies have a lot of money and they're very powerful. And yet, I argue in my book, especially when you look at the 1970s, that the federal government is not powerless. The powerless are the people, the vulnerable people in the creeks. Yes, this one are powerless. But the government, they have a position on the NNPC today also as, it, as a gatekeeper. They can block production. So there is negotiation. And I wouldn't go into this view that Africans are poor, so they are manipulated by the big powers that be. No. I think the government, the federal government also has power, not only international oil companies. So I think you should also distinguish between companies and governments. Let me give you a few examples. These international oil companies, uh, some of them are uh, completely private or they have a few public shares, but they are basically they uh, are under private shareholders, you know. And sometimes, well, their business is to make profit. It's, it's capitalist enterprise. And sometimes their agenda to make profit is different from one of the state. Let me give you a few examples that will clarify the issue. I don't have one in mind when it comes to Total in France, so I will give you a few examples of uh, international companies, US companies. During the Cold War, you know, you had the US against the USSR. And Angola was pro-Russian, it was pro-communist, and you had a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, Chevron was very much there. And the funny thing about it is that, okay, the U.S. was fighting against Angola through South Africa, so they were fighting against the government in power, the communist government in power in Rwanda. And who was funding the government? An American oil company. The same with uh, Libya, with Gaddafi. The U.S. bombed Gaddafi in the 1980s. They bombed Tripoli, they, you know, they were... But who was producing oil for Gaddafi? How did he make his money? Do you think Gaddafi knows anything about oil? No. It's not competent for that. American oil companies. So it's not the same. People sometimes think it's too simple. That's why I was really insisting on the complexity, you know. The state can have a different political agenda. Even such a state as the US, which is very powerful, can have a different agenda from the one of their own American oil companies. I could give you more examples, but let me, let me stop here to answer your uh, second questions because there are so many interesting questions. So I really like this uh, this debate, even if we disagree, you know. But that's part of uh, political science. Um, I've never I've never met two political scientists to agree anyway. So <laughs> why should it change now? Uh, on, the, on the PIA, well, my view is that normally it should be oil companies paying taxes to the state, and the state would develop the oil communities. Not the other way around, you know, because today the state is saying, okay, the oil companies will do the job for us, but the oil companies, they are profit-making companies. They know nothing about schools, health centers, so usually they hire some NGOs to do the job or contractors, and it's not well done. It's not their job. They don't know how to do it. And I'm not optimistic, and I think on this one we agree, on this chapter 3 of the PIA. Uh, which indeed uh, gives responsibility to the oil companies to organize the trustees of some funds that will, maybe some governor stooge will come and take the assets and take the money. I'm not sure it will really improve development, I'm afraid. Uh, but for me, the, 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 the best solution would be, like in any other country actually, 
not any, because some countries have problems, developing countries, but in, in developed countries where they produce oil, like in Canada, like in Norway, oil companies pay tax to the state and the state provide the social service. And that's how it should do. Don't expect oil companies to be charities. My friend, please, it's not charities. They are profit making and they know nothing about social services. They are not good in it and they will never be, I believe. So they subcontract com small companies or NGOs, but I'm, I think on this one we agree. I'm not very optimistic it will re really improve the situation. Not, not quite. Yes, not quiet. Yes. Oh, at least we agree on this one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, Rob. Thank you. I thank you, sir, for your analysis. What I see, you tend to blame the victims instead of those who cause the problem. And that's because you grow over colonial history. Colonial was brief, yes. But the structures we put in place and the crisis in three of past and three of affects us today. Let me take you back to 1898. The Seibon Report. The Seibon Report. 1898, that during of this country, the financial structure, that gave a large portion of states to the north and divided the south to peace me. And for that report was that there should be a central fiscal authority to collect money and share. That report gave a position to the North of advantage. And then, the North had a larger territory, far bigger territory, namely larger population sites. And the report said, revenue should be shared based on need, population size, density, and quality of states. Now, the North had more parliamentarians who made laws than the South. And nothing, all was a fraud, nothing before. You shared the archive. Nothing for the fact there was the oil mineral ordinance. We first take control of oil in the center and the crown. In the crown. It was that oil mineral ordinance that gave back to the 1969 Federal Act. What it says, the oil belongs to the central government. And the any activity that the so called operations made by death penalty, that's when we were seed. These are patterns that affect us. What is the revenue? We get pitans. The so called PIA, how can Kogi, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a host community, Kogi, and those who suffer from oil get 3% of what? You said corruption is not the only, not the only factor. Oil is a dominant factor. Oil has been a so called internal colonialism, internal colonial order. While those who assume the old Nigeria have connections with those minority areas, upon their own chiefs and, and then collaborators and share the work, up to the rural communities and for Ogoni. Then they went to Abuja to ask for oil resumption and to ask for pardon. Those who went to Abuja, were well, the same men who walked the Bacha to keep her away others. Yes, they are colonizers. So your analysis, blame the victim. That I see. Thank you. Well, no, no, no. It's, it's really hard to understand what yeah. you said. Huh? The, 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 the mic, the micro, ça marchait pas bien. J'entendais pas bien. What he's saying is that your analysis blames the victim. Yeah, 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 I understand that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, but from, from what I understand of your uh, question, uh, you're also raising the issue of resource control, and which is the claim of militants. So my question, let me be a bit tricky and answer to your question by another question. If you raise the derivation percentage from 13% to 25 or 50%, what will it change if the uh, oil producing states are corrupt anyway? Do you think it would really improve the situation on the local governments, you know? 
but maybe we should we should go forward because there are many questions so uh, I, I won't go further into into this one yeah the next person um, mine will be to uh, make um, uh, some kind of suggestion because that would have been where I wanted to know your view about what should be the way forward because it appears that uh, the situation has actually become intractable. You know, we are not agreeing on anything. So what then should be the, the solution? But I think, and I agree with you, that the character of the state is very, very important. We need to interrogate the Nigerian state. Um, I, I was reading the, the Botswana model, and, and I so love it. Uh, and I think if we can recommend that to, to Nigeria, that will also be you know, uh, very wonderful. You know, the management of uh, uh, mineral wealth, especially diamond in, in Botswana, uh, has been uh, you know has been productive. So, um, my question will be: What then is your recommendation for a way forward? Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Well, first I'd say that the solution is in your hands, not 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 mine. I, I don't have solutions. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking as a foreigner, I've got my own paradigm, my own model, and if I were to follow my own political culture, I would say that the main issue has to do with bad governance. So then I would have key words, two key words to work on. One has to do with corruption and the impunity of the ruling class. The impunity of the ruling class is really you know, when they use armed gangs to win the elections and so forth. And I'm, I won't name names, don't worry, oh, <laughs> but we all know who I am talking about. And as long as it continues, if you focus only on oil companies, it will not improve the situation. So the solution is in your hands. Work on, on I mean, corruption is, is terrible. And it's at all levels, not only in Abuja. Let me put it maybe this way. In Abuja, if they have $100 million to share, they will take 10, which is 10%. Okay? But if you go at the state government level, maybe they have only 10 million to share. You know, they have less to share than, of course, in the federal government. So they have 10 million and they will take 5, which is 50%, not 10. And you know, like me, if you go at the local government level, they have only one million to share. They take the whole million, and you know that. And you know that. So then you, you tell me, oh, resource control, you should raise up the derivation percentage from 13%. For what? If they take 100%, they will still take 100%, but they will divert more money. So, I mean, as long as it continues, I don't see how it will improve. So the solution is in your hands. You are the people of Niger Delta, not me. So. Yeah, I'm afraid. Good morning, sir. My name is Boma Amaso. I'm a PhD candidate in this department. I want to thank you for your wonderful presentation. I want to stand with you and agree with you on the issue of criminality in the Niger Delta. If the argument is that this is our commonwealth, those who have been engaged in stealing this, our commonwealth, have practiced individualism. They have used that commonwealth to better themselves, not the communities. So, I agree with you, sir. We have the NDDC board, the contracts are mainly done by people from the Niger Delta. They don't execute those projects. Yesterday, there was an information that the former minister of petroleum, Denis Desani, Alison Madiki, bought brass, brass for $3.2 million. It's there all over the social media. She is a Niger Delta. Those were funds that should have been channeled to better the people. So I agree that it is greed. 
And I agree that, yes, our problem resides with us. Now, away from that, sir, you mentioned something very critical that gave me goosebumps. When you said it, I shivered, and I looked forward, and I looked at Nigeria, and I was afraid. You said by the year 2050, the world was going to shift, or is going to shift from fossil fuels. The world is going to be using gas, cleaner energy. And Nigeria is an economy dependent on fossil fuels. And I begin to wonder, when America, France, China, India do not need our fuel, how do we survive? How do we fund infrastructure, capital projects? What will happen to the Nigerian state? So I ask you, sir, with all humility, what do you think Nigeria, the people and the government, should start to do before we face that crisis? Because I go back to the Bible, if you permit me, that Joseph had a dream. And the dream was there was going to be seven years of abundance and there was going to be seven years of famine. And they began to prepare. They began to supply food. Famine is coming to Nigeria by 2050. What do we do, sir? Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for these two questions. Actually, you are more brave than I because you name names. Um, I didn't know about the brass, but it's just one uh, illustration. I would, there are, and that's what I like in Nigeria, there are people who, not only people who are honest, but there are committed people. And there's one NGO that comes to my mind. They are based in Abuja. Maybe you know them. It's called Budget. B-U-D-G-I-T. And what they do, and I think it should be developed in the Naja Delta, you know? They, know. they do it in the Naja Delta. Basically what they do, when you've got a state government budget, they vote it, the uh, provisional budget, they vote it in the beginning of the year, but then at the end of the year you don't have the full budget, so you don't know really how much was spent. So what they take is, these budgets, provisional budgets, are published, and there's a line saying, okay, we are going to build a school in Aoda. So at the end of the year they go, and they look, and no, no school was built. So they make a picture of the bush, and they publish all the lists of the items in the budget where the government was supposedly going to pay for a new school or health center, and they show the bush, and they, they ask the government, OK, what happened? Where is the money? You know? And I think this kind of small advocacy you know, is, I'm a scientist, so I'm an evidence-based. And when you have the evidence, when you show exactly the level of corruption, and, okay, there's one thing you cannot work on, which is security vote. This one is too dangerous. But for the local governments, it's very possible to challenge them or their budget and see how much money they got, what they said they were going to do and they did not do it. And this is very practical. This is possible. And you can mobilize people on that, you know. As for the lack of vision, I'm, I'm as impressed as you. There's a planning issue in, in, in Nigeria, you know. The PIA is not really addressing this issue of the 2050 uh, benchmark, you know. And there's no national vision in the current government about the future of a rentier economy, because Nigeria is a rentier economy. The oil industry, oil and gas, of course, is still providing the main bulk of the revenue of the government, of the federal government, before they share with the states and the local governments. Yes, so you are very right. I fully agree with you. What will happen in 2050? And there's no anticipation, there's no vision, there's no national vision, there's no planning. And it's, I'm also scared for Nigeria when I look at that, because other countries are already planning for that. And they are investing, okay, gas is probably the most, uh, the resource that Nigeria could continue after 2050. So there's more prospect in gas than in, in oil, that's for sure. Uh, NLNG, you know. Um, but for other renewable uh, energy, I, I don't know, really. I don't know. I didn't get a vision from the government when it comes to this issue. Yeah. Okay, please. Uh, I know if we allow everybody to talk, um, 
6 p.m. we will be here. Please, I'm a gender-friendly person. There's a lady, sorry, sorry, Kaisha. There's a lady that, uh, yes. Um, thank you, sir, for the opportunity to talk as a first girl speaking here in this conference. But, monsieur, s'il vous plaît, nous ne pouvons pas we're not really hearing you when you were speaking here, and we came in mm. late, kind of. But yeah, my question here is, the first person that asked the question, you didn't really, um, I would say you didn't give answer. He didn't answer his question well, but I don't, I do not understand the answer you gave to this question. And I want to repeat the question simultaneously. So my question here is, I don't know what's the definition of crime to everyone, but you ask me, I feel the Niger Delta, we are, we are very much disadvantaged when it comes to the oil production here in Nigeria. And so if this person that um, goes to um, take oil illegally and you call them criminals, then what do we call those persons? Okay, the people at the government level, at the higher position, where they call when they took the when the oil um headquarters is supposed to be in the Niger Delta, they took it to the north, and the north literally rolled and run over the Niger Delta. What do we call them? Mm. I think you should distinguish between two things. When um, somebody from the ruling class is uh, is not from the Niger Delta and he's taking the money and he diverts it for his own profit, he is a criminal. But a northern state that within the federation receives money and the money comes from oil, it's a federal system. So I wouldn't say this is criminal. It is the system that was put in place during and after the Biafra war. You can challenge it if you want. And I'm not the one to decide, but that's not criminal. So if you have issues with the definition of crime, I suggest you ask a jurist more than me. <laughs> but again, when there is corruption at the highest level, diversion of oil money, say by a Hausa, is a criminal. Or a Fulani is a criminal. But using the oil money to develop the North is not crime as such. It's part of a legal system. Maybe you don't like it, but then that's beyond my... <laughs> issue of definition of crime. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Sharp, uh, I'm a lecturer in the Department of Foreign Languages. I want to make a contribution. We're talking about uh, conflict in the Nanja Delta. I want to say that the major blame about the conflict in the Nanja Delta rests squarely on two major stakeholders, uh, that is the oil companies and the state. The violence that is seen in the communities and the, what we call the bandits is it's just a fallout. It's a fallout of the economic violence that the state and the oil com companies are visiting upon the people of the Niger Delta. Now, I want to make it clear. The state is even the number one culprit by instituting, by establishing, incorporating the NNPC. Now, the first refinery in Nigeria was built by Shell BP, 1965, run by Shell BP. And by 1977, the Nigerian government incorporated NNPC and took over the refinery from Shell and went on to build other refineries. But from 1977 till date, NNPC has criminally mismanaged the Commonwealth of Nigeria. Criminally. That it is only last year that they declare profit. 
of about 200 and something billion, billion naira, not, not dollars. After more than 40 years, criminally mismanaged our commonwealth. Now they have no vision. They did not invest in adding value to the oil, to the crude oil. What happens in Nigeria is exactly what the late Ufo Bonyi in Kodiwa was lamenting until he died. He called that the deterioration of the terms of exchange. That Africa exports crude raw materials and imports finished products. And so we sell raw materials at cheap uh, uh, cost of price and we import finished products at exorbitant price and so we keep on getting impoverished. And so Nigeria today exports crude and imports refined products. And this is a company, this is a, a country that set up a national uh, 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 petroleum company for about 40 years ago and we're still importing refined products. Impoverishing. So we get for a barrel of, of, of crude oil, for one barrel, you may sell it for let's say hundred dollars. But once you refine it, you add value to it, you may get more than 300 400 dollars from that same barrel. And so we sell hundred dollars, we beat our chest, they were oil producing country, and then through the back, without even a, a budgetary uh, allocation, we go and and, 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 and pay for uh, imported uh, uh, products. And so, that lack of vision is what is killing this country. And again, the oil companies, they know very well, these oil companies, back in France, they don't have oil in France, but these oil companies, they have refineries in France. They have petrochemicals companies, they have everything. Now in Nigeria, they don't have it. They will say it is the company, it is the, it is the country, it's the country's policies. But it's not a matter of policies. After all, Dangote is building, is building a refinery in Lagos. But no oil company, none of the major oil companies has taken upon themselves to say they will also build. Because that is where they add value. They are not talking also about research or investment so as to promote renewable energies in Nigeria, but they do that in their own countries. And so you, you see that there is, there is a partnership between these oil companies and the Nigerian state. A visionless state that has continued to impoverish the people of this, of this, of this country. So, I, well, I, want to, I, just want to, I just want to rest my case here. Thank you very much. Yeah, that, was, that was a remark. So we'll take the last one. After the last speaker, please uh, do not uh, rush. Uh, you will give us a souvenir. That's after my boss would have made a, a final uh, remark. You will give us a souvenir so that we we'll stay back and uh, have a snapshot with us. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, presenter. I am also appreciative for the number of research you've done that translated into so many books um, uh, as the outcome of your research. My name is Dr. Kiale Yanyan, a political science department. Um, I want to ask one question and then draw attention to the question that the students are asking that seem not appropriately answered and also uh, contribute to that. Um, will you really say that what we suffer in the United Delta is resource cost. In the sense that, is it this? Is it actually oil that is our problem, or the institutions, you know, and the regulatory framework? In other words, the governance of the oil itself that is our major problem. Because you can see the sentiment that is being shared. I mean, by the students and almost every other person. That sentiment revolves around the issue of ownership of oil and who benefits from it. That's why the question is coming back. Will you say that 
those who engage in oil bunkering are actually criminals, okay? And then the, the new perspective that we are trying to look, I mean, to look at that from now is that the people that we call criminals are posing a new form of resistance, okay? And so the, 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 the idea of criminalization do not, does not bond well with the people from this part of the region because it is actually very difficult to differentiate between the states, the Nigerian state as a criminal you know, organization and its subsidiary institutions like the NNPC that you mentioned about. So can we see oil theft, oil bunkering as a form of resistance by the local people? This is not to say that um, uh, it's an argument in support of you know, uh, stealing of oil, but it's an argument that is in concern with the struggle you know, for self-determination in terms of how do we govern oil resources? How do we ensure that people do not capture benefits against those people who bear the bodies of, you know, uh, oil exploitation in terms of ecological devastation. We saw what is happening, I mean, we see what is happening in Ogoni. In terms of the oil, you know, uh, the Ogoni cleanup, for example. So, will we say that oil is actually the cause of our problem or the management? Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Um, if you ask me, do I see bunkering as an act of resistance? I would tell you no. It's polluting the Nanda Delta. It's criminal to do that. I filmed it. It's disgusting. It's, it's, it's polluting. It's also a big issue when it comes to pollution. If you ask me, if is the passive resistance of Kensar River and Mosul blocking road access roads to Shell, is it an act of resistance? I would tell you yes. Yes, it is. But not bunkering, please. Not bunkering. If you live near the place where they bunker oil, you would suffer a lot. I'm telling you. Are these people helping their own people? No, they are not. They are polluting the Nanda Delta for 50 years, for one century. So they are criminals to me. Okay, we disagree. Sorry about that. But no, it's not an act of resistance. So don't add a political reading of it. No, I, I, I would surely disagree. But again, Mossop. On the first stage of the IYC or the INC, uh, yes, the Ijo National Congress, yes, when they were into passive resistance, blocking access, yes, I would agree this is an act of resistance, but not polluting your own country, no, no, that cannot be seen as an act of resistance. As for the NNPC, Charles, let me clarify a few things. So the NNPC was uh, established in 1977, right, yes? and uh, after the National Oil Company, and for the first time they published their accounts in 2020. 1977 up to 2020. When I'm talking about impunity, I'm also talking about accountability. This is extraordinary. This company, this public company, is a major source of funding that should actually develop the Niger Delta. So what's going on? in the NNPC. This is a question you should, you should ask, you know, not focusing only on Shell and the others. NNPC, I fully agree with you, is quite an issue and refinery, of course. But again, I would clarify a few things. I wouldn't sell that Nigeria sell cheap raw material like crude oil. They sell it the international price, like in Norway, like in other oil producing countries. They sell it the normal price. The problem is where the money goes, you know. And that was a bit of an issue I had with the NEITA, you know, that Obasanjo, President Obasanjo uh, set up in Nigeria, the uh, Nigerian Extractive uh, Industry Transparency Initiative. Because what they look at is they check that international oil companies pay taxes, and these taxes go to the central uh, bank of Nigeria, the CBN. Good enough, but it's not enough. What we want to know is then where is the money going once it is in the CBN? So it's our job, you know. And then, of course, the big issue is how the money is spent, how it is used. 
And that's where NGOs like Budget, I think, are doing a good, uh, a good job. But otherwise, I would agree with you, the terms of exchange are, uh, when you pr don't have added value, is not good for a country like Nigeria. Uh, but you should distinguish also, the oil industry is complex. I didn't have time to say a word about it, and maybe that would be a good, uh, a good conclusion, because I think we could continue the discussion for long. But in the oil industry, you've got three sectors, you know, you've got the upstream sector, which is ENP, exploration and production. This one are producing crude oil, okay? Then you have the midstream, organizing the transport of crude oil for exporting pipelines, you know, up to the terminal. And then you have downstream. And downstream is a distribution of refined product. And it is important because refined products are much more inflammable than crude oil. I film, some of my photos are showing it, you know, when there is a leak of crude oil, you can go on and try to burn it, it will not explode. It's different from refined products. So refined products are much more lethal, but it's run by the NNPC. So these are only NNPC products. Because the international oil companies are into the upstream sector. The only companies that remain a bit in distribution is Total, the French company. But the total distribution, the downstream total distribution, is completely different from total ENP, exploration and production. Actually, they don't, they don't have the same orders. It's two different companies. They bear the same name, but it's two different companies. And except for total, all the others, Chevron, Shell, and so on, they stopped the downstream sector because they don't make much money with it. Actually, they would even lose it. So I think there is a misunderstanding because where the Nigerian oil is refined, it's not in Europe or what. The big refinery of the world, the biggest exporter of refined product in the world is India. That's where the huge refineries are. And actually, India is refining crude oil for all the developing countries. It's quite impressive. So they are, because you have a few refineries in France or in Britain, but it's just for the local market. They're not exporting. Whereas, when you import refined product, you would import it from refineries from India. Again, remember that the international oil companies are not in the downstream sector. They used to be, like Shell or Texaco and so forth, but that's finished because only Total remain, they have a bit of assets and I think they will get rid of it quite soon. So I think we should uh, remember that the oil industry is quite complex and we have to make a clear distinction between the upstream sector and the downstream sector. It's two different things. And thank you so much for this lively debate. I mean, it's been uh, quite Apologies challenging. to all the people that would have loved to make contributions or ask questions. Um, please, at this point, I will I'll bring in the director of Alliance Francaise to give us a closing remark. She, she is a social cultural engineer. I believe she has more of this kind of uh, uh, expose for the university. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. So, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Marc Andras and Mr. Monclo. I'm very happy that uh, with the uh, Uniport, um, Mr. Fidelis and Monsieur Expo, we achieved to organize that and meet you today. So I'm just new uh, in Port Harcourt, arrived one month ago, and I hope we will have a good partnership between uh, Alliance Francaise and uh, Uniport. So for the one who don't know Alliance Francaise, we are a cultural center. We are a non-profit association based in uh, OGRA in Port Harcourt. And uh, we are also a uh, center for French language, so Nigerians or anyone can come to learn French. And also we are an official center for exams. But time to time, when we have guests like Marc Antoine, we bring them and we try to find partnership with the Nigerian university or association or, I don't know, like anyone to bring some projects or some books or some ideas through Port Harcourt. So you are very welcome to follow us on the social media or website to know the program of cultural activity. It's not so much, but time to time, maybe some of them can interest you. So I'm happy to be with you, and thank you very much for all your remarks, your questions. That was very interesting. You saw you. Welcome to the Agent Francais when you want, and I wish you a very good afternoon. Um, 
she has said it all. Uh, thank you for being here, and uh, we hope that in the near future we'll be having this kind of. Uh, in fact, I'm I'm so happy with. I'm so proud of uh, these two departments. I'm a product of this university. Uh, um, the University of uh, the Faculty of uh, Humanities. Then my home base was the FLN, and uh, I had this fun chance also for the Department of Pole Science because uh, I remember in our days, every Wednesday, we sit around to listen to all those academic luminaries. Thank you very much for coming, and please give us this souvenir. We'd like to have some snapshots with you outside. Thank you.